I was the first on the moon. Today we're going to be looking at how I approached a couple of the scenes in the cell phone commercial I was the DP on. This is my first time working with the director and the job in itself happened pretty last minute so the prep on it was a little condensed. I didn't have much time to second guess my approach or draw up a bunch of lighting plans so I've spent some time retracing my steps and going down the rabbit hole of the prep process for this video. Interestingly, a lot of the magic of this piece is found in the spontaneity with which we had to approach it. The director is incredibly confident and passionate. He's an absolute dream to shoot with, constantly pushing the emotion through imagery. His goal for this film was to create something engaging and emotive. Throughout the film, we're introduced to a series of character vignettes. The voiceover is from the perspective of the phone and all the moments they get to witness. The idea is born from the history of Hasselblad and how Hasselblad cameras were used to capture a lot of important moments throughout human history. The director had referenced a lot of black and white photography in his treatment, and we discussed the importance of pushing the photography to highlight the standout feature of this phone, the Hasselblad camera. A lot of attention was given to the photography, particularly in terms of pushing for massive wides and intimate macro work. Most of the interest I have received to break down this piece is centered around our moon landing sequence, so I will begin with that. Research phase. <laughs> um, first man, I think um, the director had seen a couple of behind the scenes things of how they did the moon landing in this. I'd seen the film and thought it looked great, so I kind of used it as my first port of call in figuring out how I was going to light this. It's worth mentioning that we were shooting this on a soundstage, uh, not a very big one, and we were shooting digital, so you know you could argue that we didn't need the same amount of output as they did for First Man shooting on a 500T film. I also wanted you know, a big single source, and I didn't even know about 100K Soft Suns until I started researching this. See this crazy thing. So that, um, that is two 100K Soft Suns in some sort of a truss, it looks like, um, on a big crane. And Lena Sangren, the DP of this film, writes, I wanted to light that whole Tranquility base set with a single source lamp. We tested 200k soft suns stacked together, mounted 500 feet away and at the correct azimuth 16 degrees up on the crane. Then he goes on to speak about how it worked well exposure wise um, and then got in conversation with the actual company, Luminous, that makes the soft sun um, about making a 200k specifically for their film. That was well beyond the scope of what we were doing but this put me on the right path I think knowing that the 100k soft sun is how I wanted to do this gives you a little bit more information here about the kind of stop that they had with the distances they were working at. And you'll find often that when you start doing kind of bigger setups and bigger lamps and that kind of thing, it's quite difficult to get information about stuff online. Um, it's obviously very easy to get information about aperture softboxes and like kind of more YouTuber film making or like uh, content world stuff. But as soon as you get into the big stuff, um, it can be kind of tricky and I remember googling uh you know just doing some research online about the 100k soft sun and f came across an article from a long time ago Heute von Heutema had posted on the cinematography.com forum some questions about the soft sun which i thought was quite funny if there's anything to take away from this video is that like research is an incredibly valuable prep tool it's so important to read about the approach and the motivation, for example, obviously with the soft sun, the idea is, is that you're trying to replicate the sun as well as you can. And obviously with the moon, it really is only a single source, like a single light source, like any contamination, unless it's bouncing off the, the suits of the astronaut or something, um, it's kind of not very authentic. So that was a big kind of question mark solved for me in a lot of ways. At the time of making this, a couple of years ago, I hadn't gotten into Blender or any kind of previous software yet, but I quickly made a model of our studio space for this video, kind of just to make sure that the distances and stuff I had scribbled down made sense. The soundstage we were working with was 30 by 40 meters. It was eight meters to the gantry, um, to the lighting grid. Don't have it written down anywhere, and I can't find the sort of um, conversation with the PD or anything, but I'm guesstimating it was probably about 20 meters wide uh, and about 15 deep and we prioritized having it uh, 
sort of fall off towards the back. So if you look at this, our camera position is, is here, looking that way. We have the sort of length of our studio side to side. And we're prioritizing having way more of our lunar surface behind because we kind of knew that we would keep the bottom edge of frame um, you know pretty tidy and we wanted as much fall off as possible so that the compositors didn't have to add and ex do too much sort of set extension in this instance the lamp was here on a crane um, or sort of like a cherry picker small scissor lift this is sort of the widest we ever went in camera um, we had the camera on a giraffe crane kind of just rolling up and down the studio floor here kind of jibbing up and over coming in for our close-ups over here on the um, on the camera it was just a very easy way for us to move the camera around into all these unique positions and make kind of really nice big cinematic camera movements I kind of was able to do a slightly better job in real life than what I did in, in here um, to try flag as much of the spill light from this big soft sun here or, um, off of this back wall. Over here in the background you can see these kind of joins and there was just no way to get the kind of quality of light that I wanted in the foreground and keeping this deep kind of black fall off in the back here. Fortunately, I mean, you know, apart from the halation making things a little bit tricky, these are pretty clean edges um, on, a, on a mostly black background, so that's a pretty easy rotoscoping job. Like in the greater scheme of all the post work that was going to have to happen, sometimes you have to make a compromise. Um, it's pointless changing the way that you light the foreground elements completely, n not being happy with it, getting a better key or a you know, better compositing job but having a shitty looking shot. It's more important to be happy with the way that you've lit your VFX elements than it is to make the job easy. Obviously, as a cinematographer, it's a big part of your job to make it as easy as possible for the compositors and VFX people to do the work that they need to do. But again, it's a waste of everyone's time if what you've shot doesn't look any good. This is quite a nice way to see this setup. Over here, you can see the kind of pulley system that the stunt team had to suspend the astronauts from. As far as I remember, we had our first full kind of dress rehearsal with stunt rigs and everything on the shoot day. So this would have been one of our first attempts at a wide take. We obviously refined it quite a bit and then shooting at 36 frames kind of just gave us that floaty weightlessness that you have on the moon. These are big blackouts that I put up um, in hindsight. Probably would have been good to have another one. This is a really good example of how making a 3D model can be really useful to figure out the amount of 20 by 20 frames you need in this instance. Um, I hadn't done this in pre-production for this and I would have been able to see that five, which is what we had, wouldn't quite be enough. Here you can see that the moon landing pod uh, has a base, uh, which obviously is composited out of the final kind of version of this. Our production design team on this job was incredible. Um, every single thing that they built or dressed or scenic was immaculate. This lunar surface is incredible. Like how great does that surface look? Totally insane. I was super anxious about these kind of big golden reflective orbs. Um, but we ended up, because the studio was so black and we managed to keep the camera relatively far away, you know, the helmets reflect what's, what's lit. And in our case, all the moon stuff was the most lit. So we actually had pretty clean reflections for the most part. I'm sure that they had to paint out one or two things, but yeah, super, super happy and lucky with that actually. Flying around in Blender here, um, you get a kind of idea of the scale of this space. Um, not super big. And the relative position of the soft sun over here and our kind of main set area over here. Um, here you can see that big cutter um, to keep a lot of that light off the back. Just big single soft source. Easy game. <laughs> yeah, so one thing I did actually want to check, um, just to get an idea of the distance we had from this lamp to our set, is probably about 18 meters um, to the center of our set. 
um, if you look at the relative position of the soft sun and our sort of where the astronauts were. So we could kind of do these very controlled cinematic moves just up and down here with the crane, kind of get up in these positions. Um, could come in here for close-ups without making any footprints on our beautiful scenic floor. I wanted to take a quick moment to have a look at this interior with the astronauts. We have kind of two main sequences here. One is with a lot of camera shake, and then we also have a 360 roll um, that kind of transitions into the architect scene. Um, this is a different build to the exterior pod that we have on the lunar surface. Just a really, really beautiful piece of production design. We predominantly just have a 4K mole beam, which is like a parallel beam HMI source at this kind of an angle coming through this little window. What was quite interesting or kind of nice about this is between the white suits and the kind of light gray, battleship gray interior, it's quite a lot of natural bounce happening. Um, I do remember back here, sort of behind the astronauts heads, also playing with some kind of a small LED source, um, playing back here, kind of flashing and doing fun stuff. Then we had this big LED screen, which is the footage that you see outside the window of the Earth. I can't remember the dimensions on that. It was pretty oversized because we also used it to shoot the miniatures, um, which I'm pretty sure they ended up just rotoscoping and putting on CG backgrounds anyway, but always nice to have stuff in camera to be able to see it without having to imagine too much. In terms of camera movement, we tested a rig on the Ronin um, to be able to do kind of a nodal roll. And then for whatever reason, that actually wasn't working on the day. So we ended up doing this manually with a Ronford F7 head. I just had to physically kind of rotate the camera. We ended up doing the same thing in the architect office. And then for the handout stuff, a lot of camera shake. So just shaking the camera as much as you can, kind of getting in there. We had the set builders kind of holding onto corners of the uh, lander and shaking it quite vigorously, which had an added benefit of like a lot of atmospheric dust and stuff flying around. Moving on to this festival scene that transitions into the restaurant. Uh, we shot the festival footage on a Phantom Flex with our K35 lenses, and then that's comped into the cell phone shot. The cell phone shot in itself is just a lower probe lens looking straight down at our phone screen, and then we're just jibbing out on the dolly. This is a little sketch from the location scout, which I made to send through to the production designer, just to explain that we were gonna have to do some kind of greens like a trellis with vines or something to basically contain the background a bit and to save me from that really blown out sidewalk and stuff. Um, and I think that worked out quite beautifully. Our camera's over here looking that way. The trick with this location was that we had quite a small uh, kind of pavement next to this outside area to work with. And we had a live road on this side. Um, we could park a car so we could get our generator like right here but we couldn't put any lamps in the street. The idea was to kind of try and keep as much ambient um, off of this foreground area here and kind of back here um, to try and get a nice strong lighting push through this gap um, onto our sort of hero table. Pretty sure we had an 18K over here. I think this would have been quite a bit further kind of back this way. Um, I just drew it kind of close. I don't think we would have been able to fit anything bigger than maybe an 8x8 frame with ultra probably. And then one of those dado uh, reflectors, which is similar to the light bridge, to make a kind of hot spot. And I think we put this through some sort of a light cloth, if I look at the quality of light from the footage, but I can't actually remember. Might have also had a black flag or something in close in front of camera here to knock this foreground down. One thing that was kind of unusual, which I had, I'm not sure I've done again, um, was we used a hazer outside, which could look kind of strange, but I think in the sort of vibe and the abstract nature of this piece, it, it worked pretty well. And here you can see this woman's hand in the foreground, like super dark behind a flag or something, you know, just keeping light off of here. And then we're hitting through here with a much harder slash into the foreground. I imagine that's with one of the mirrors, just redirecting our 18K. And then the rest of our 18K push is predominantly kind of coming through here onto them. And then obviously we have all this residual spill from the natural ambience. You can imagine without this trellis back here, um, that would have just been super flat and gray. 
always worth looking at or discussing with your production designer if there's something about a location that's a bit of a lighting nightmare. Um, if you're compromised in terms of times of time of day or something, if there's a simple something you can do um, to give you contrast in the background. I think it's important to not just think of contrast in terms of lighting ratio. You can add visual interest with a bunch of different things. So moving on to looking at this fencing scene, um, we had this big beautiful velodrome. Shot most of this on the Alexa with K35s and then a handful of shots, which are pretty obvious, the slow motion ones on Phantom. I remember having the 4K mole beam just off the edge of frame here, and that's kind of pointing up, giving us this pocket of light in the rafters to bring out some of that detail. And then there's three of these backlights, um, there's two more over here, kind of these foreground elements give us some nice depth. For the phone stuff, I imagine we would have walked a trace frame, so like a diffusion frame in really close, and some black neg on this side. Um, so if you imagine kind of just trying to give it as much shape as possible by killing light coming from this side, having our big bounce on this side, coming through an additional diffusion frame before it hits here. And then with the reflectors, uh, you can kind of position them relative to the reflective areas like lenses to get these perfect white um, kind of pings in the shiny bits. Moving on to this lounge, I think my favorite thing about this location is this beautiful old parkade floor. So I knew that I wanted to kind of prioritize looking down. And I guess to add to that, we had to shoot here while the whole garden was front lit. So our department put up these pretty thick foil curtains for us. Blacked out all along this side of this room. Um, if you can imagine the room kind of continuing over here, made sure to keep all of that negative for this shot. So there's not a lot of ambience in the room itself. And then on this little balcony up here, we would have had an 18K bouncing into a white 8x4 poly, giving us kind of a softer, rapier light coming in here. And then the 4K HMI mole beam giving us really beautiful parallel beam, like very believable, like sunlight looking light um, coming in here just at the right angle. And naturally just from bouncing off the wall, like in the corner here and everything, we have enough on the shadow side to have a really nice contrast ratio, I think. I mean, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have had this super loud front lit garden out here, but I think we get away with it. This back shot on the beach was quite fun. Obviously you're chasing the right time of day for this. So you're sort of lining up for the shot before the light is ideal, finding the frame, making sure you're ready for it. We had to dig a hole for the camera to get it low enough to be able to still see some of this horizon. We have a sky panel S120, I think, um, I can't really tell from this photo. It could be an S60. It looks a little bit wider for some reason. Um, but anyway, we have some sort of an LED source off camera right over here. And then we have a source for over there kind of backlighting towards a reflector, which is right next to the lens over here, filling in all of this. And again, giving us this sort of very pure, very clean light. For this car scene, we're on a process trailer and we have a small LED lamp um, sort of in her lap, uplighting her face to look like the cell phone light. And then this car had a sunroof and we had a light mat stuck down to it. But these sunroofs are extremely tinted always, so we're getting like just a tiny bit of this ambient here, um, which is cool, you know, just to make out a little bit of detail inside. I do remember using a diopter for this and her being just on the edge of focus. Um, you can see our kind of depth of field is razor thin, like the fall off here is quite aggressive and towards the foreground here. And in addition to that, you know, using diopters, especially on, you know, the K35s on Super 35 cameras are a little bit cleaner because you're not shooting so much of the lens. You're not seeing all the edges, but adding the diopters kind of gives you these messed up chromatic aberrations and stuff, which I think are quite cool. We're on a process trailer and we have a pickup truck driving next to us with a water bowser and some water sprays um, for the rain effects. 